Uh, I think it's time to begin. A uh, very warm welcome to all of you. Do you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, my name is uh, Tono Renner Rasmussen. I'm going to be hosting this uh, event, this first uh, in a series of three lectures, Puffendorf lectures that will be held then by Professor Jonathan Dancy. Um, um, when the Swedish king, Karl XI, came up with the brilliant idea of, of having a university in, in, in Lund, um, he had very high ambitions. <coughs> so he put in lots of money in, in the foundation. He bought waste amount of land that the university, to a great extent, still owed, I think, for some reason. And then he also supported, I, I suppose it was not his idea, but he supported the idea of bringing in what was at that time considered the sharpest political philosopher of his time, namely uh, Pufendorf. So when some years afterwards, some of you would probably say many years afterwards, but let's not quibble about words. So some years afterwards, the philosophy department and its three units, cognitive science, practical philosophy and theoretical philosophy also came up with the brilliant idea of having a series of lectures in the name of Pufendorf. We also had very high ambitions. We gave up after a tough discussion the idea of, of acquiring land, <laughs> but, um, um, but we did insist on bringing in the sharpest brains and the, the people that have been giving contributing most to, to the sort of research field that we've been, been working on. Yeah, th this is Jonathan Dancy, all right. Uh, and, um, and so I'm very, very thrilled to be able to, to say that our ambition this year has been fulfilled again by, by us having Jonathan here. So Jonathan mm -hmm. Dancy has, during many years, continuously spoiled his colleagues and made the life tougher for students by providing groundbreaking work in, in several of the core areas in philosophy that, that we are dealing with in Lund. No? So moral philosophy is just one of them. So in one of his first books, he challenged what has very often been considered to be sort of the, the, very, the very quest for a moral philosopher, namely to, to determine and to find the principle or the set of principles that should govern us if we want to be moral agents. No. Now, moral principles is not something, at best they are harmless and at worst they can really do harm to us as moral agents no, or to the, 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 the nature of morality. So, but moral philosophy is actually just one of the areas where, where Jonathan has, has contributed. Um, so I, the, the field of action theory, I don't know if we call it that. Yeah, you do. You do here we do. No? do Practical <laughs> deliberation, work on reason, all of these areas are, are areas where the work of Jonathan Dancy is, is a sort of must if you want to, to study these, these uh, fields. No. So, for instance, his ideas about recent holism that I hope uh, that you might be talking about, which in many ways sounds <laughs> like a commonsensical idea when, when you spell it out, but there's nothing commonsensical about philosophy, as you know. So many people that have strong ideas about reasons have been struggling with this, this idea that, that what is a reason in one situation for acting need not be a reason for acting in another situation. No? It might even be a reason against acting. No? And of course, this very idea is then also very tightly connected to his idea that reasons are not general entities, but rather particulars that are extremely context sensitive. No? Which, of course, again, is tightly connected with his particularism. Uh, that's uh, a view that has sort of become associated with Jonathan Dancy's name. Now, moral philosophy is just, and practical philosophy is just one area. I was going to say that he's also contributed to value theory, but I had a discussion with Jonathan yesterday and he denies that. But, but uh, that just shows that he's wrong in something, no? Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I would only deny that in Lund. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> so Lund has for many years been associated with, with one kind of, of, of uh, value theory, namely the fitting attitude analysis. Now, the idea that we should understand values in terms of an, some normative element and some attitudinal element. No? And, and Jonathan was one of the really first ones that pinpointed one of the, or some of the problems with this kind of view. No? So, so we're glad you were here. Um, okay. so. Jonathan Dancy was educated uh, at Winchester College. Uh, he then moved on to, to Corpus Christi at Oxford, where he also actually taught for a while at, I think, Pembroke College, no? Yes, well done. And, 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 um, and then he, he moved on to University of Kiel, where he was for many years. And now uh, I was going to say that you are currently Professor of Philosophy uh, at the University of Texas, Austin, but I think you are actually retiring from there, so you are in the middle of a process. Uh, but you are also the Research Professor at, at the University of Reading in in UK now. No, that's finished. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, you have to update the, these <laughs> web pages now. That's a, it's a lot now. I'm not going to be long because I'm taking the, w the, the one, but I would like to at least read a list of some of the works that you've done. Uh, and, and, and yeah, so just keeping to the monographs. No? So, so in 1985, you published an introduction to contemporary epistemology, a work that I think, I'm not an epistemologist, but that is still referred to in, 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 in many ways. No? Then you published a book on Berkeley, a Berkeley and Introduction by Blackwell in 1987. There's one of my favorite books, More Reasons uh, by Blackwell in 1993, Practical Reality, Oxford University Press in 2000, Ethics Without Principles, Oxford Clarendon Press in 2004, and then Practical Shape, A Theory of Practical Reasoning, Oxford University Press 2080. When I think of the host of original ideas, of lucid, discerning arguments and insightful observations that these books represent, I think it's nothing but fitting to feel admiration of. And in my world, that means there's lots of value in these books. <laughs> now, Jonathan wouldn't be able to say that, yes, as he's would. not a fitting attitude, <laughs> I know this, no? but I think I think I can say that now. So, so, but I'm not going to mm. continue s with s with naming mm. all of the other works. I okay. think it's mm. time for me to shut up and to give the word to our laureate. Mm. So please join me and give him the warm welcome <laughs> that he merits. <laughs> um, <coughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So thank you to Tony for those. Um, clearly merited remarks. You know, it's nice to feel that somebody at least has read some of my books. Um, the, uh, and it's very nice to be here in general. And I hear so much about how well things are going in Lund. It's very nice to come to see for myself. Uh, that's, so don't forget, I'm judging you. Just like... <laughs> um, this, this, this set of talks, is, I should have said, it's an enormous honor to be a Pudendorf lecturer. And you know, there are not many such things available in the philosophical world, so I'm extremely pleased to have got it. Finally, in my last stage of my career, I just made it in time. <laughs> um, so back to what's going on. So in these three talks, I'm going to talk about the metaphysics of acting for a reason. Now, that, um, as soon as the word metaphysics appears, everyone thinks, oh, help, as it were, what's, what's going to happen? Um, so what I want to know is, as it were, what are the players involved in acting for a reason? Well, there's the reason. And we want to know what a reason is, and got things to say about that. And we want to know what an action is, and we've probably got things to say about that. And then there's the for bit in the middle, <laughs> and we need to know about that. <laughs> There are reasons for which we act, and there are reasons to act, and then the to. It's the little words that actually carry the, you know, the interesting bit. That's the bit we're trying to get at. You want to act for a reason, for, what, you know, what does that, what is the relation involved in that for? Believing for a reason is just the same. For, and you hope that the reason for which you act is in fact a reason so to act, to act. But the to, has a kind of direction in it. Um, it's not a simple infinitive. 
infinitive? Um, it, does, it's as it were, I think of it as a favoring relation. It speaks in favor of acting in that way, and so, something like that. So we need to sort of watch the prepositions here to make sure that we know what they're doing. Once we've worked out what we think an action is, and what we think a reason is. So there's plenty to worry about, right? just in this simple notion of acting for a reason that sometimes is a reason to act in that way. All these things have got to be lined, we've got to get our ducks lined up. I suspect that's not an expression that I should use. Um, um, so that's by way of introduction. That's what I'm going to be trying to work out. What are the bits? involved in acting for a reason and what is the relation between those bits that is expressed by the notion by the four in the middle <laughs> um, so i start with a certain metaphysical thesis um, and there's a handout which i hope you have no who hasn't got a handout one i think without the handout you have to help you have to hope <laughs> okay. Um, so here's a metaphysical. I'm not propounding this thesis. I'm introducing it. Okay. Um, intentional actions are, and this is the metaphysical events. Firstly, they're events, and even that is denied. <laughs> but according to this thesis, intentional actions are events caused in a certain way by suitable combinations of beliefs and desires in the agent, and those beliefs and desires are thought of as states in the agent. So we've got a causal relation between states in the agent and acting in a certain way, and, and the action that is done. Um, and an intentional action takes place when the action is caused by the beliefs and desires in the agent. And an unintentional action will be one that is not so caused. You do it by mistake, for instance. You do an action by mistake, it will not be caused in the right way, anyway, by beliefs and desires of yours. That's the theory. Um, now, I don't accept this thesis. I think it's completely wrong. But we have always have to have a target. Um, nothing is said here in this thesis about reasons, just causes. Reasons are going to have to be brought in later. Um, and nothing is said about unintentional actions, of which there are lots. <laughs> We're just dealing with the intentional ones. Um, now, it says suitable combinations of beliefs and desires, and obviously we need to get a proper sense to the notion of the suitable here, which are the ones that are allowed to be suitable. Um, so we're going to work on that too. So all these things are up in the air and have to be kind of nailed down and sorted out and their relations between them. Um, it sort of got to settle down. Um, so the very first question we might ask is, are, are um, actions events in the first place? Yeah. In the metaphysics of action, is an a are, are actions events? For instance, is abstaining intentionally, not doing something in the intentional sense <laughs> rather than failing to do it, <laughs> is abstaining an event? Um, what about avoiding doing something or omitting to do it? Um, one might ask, how long do such actions take? Uh, when do they happen? Sort of all the way through somehow? <laughs> it doesn't sound very happy. Um, so that's one worry about thinking that actions are events. Um, another is, um, sort of, if actions are events, which ones are they? Of course, we need to know an answer to that question. Which ones are they and when do the events happen? These are all preliminary questions. <laughs> um, can we say, for instance, that actions are events that happen because they are done? Uh, or because agents do them, if you don't like the idea of an event that happens because it's done? Well, no, because you can't do an event. That does seem sort of, well, I'm going to assert it anyway. Um, so you can't do an event. So you can't make an event into an action by doing it. Doesn't, that doesn't work. Um, instead, my working hypothesis, which I'm simply going to come out with now, 
is that an action is this complex, an agent's causing a change. So for there to be an action, there needs to be an agent, there needs to be some difference that's made, and the relevant relation is causal. So an action is an agent's causing its ch a change. Um, I'm not going to argue for this because it's incredibly hard to argue for. In the present context, I'm simply asserting it. Of course, you can cause an unchange where you s cause things not to change. <laughs> it's to stay the same. That's what an unchange is. Um, could we say more generally that to act is to make a difference? Well, even that's going to be hard to sustain. Um, my general focus here is on which of these causings or makings are intentional actions. Um, that's what I'm after. So now, a general approach comes. Uh, an intentional action is an event explained in a certain way, that is, by appeal to the reasons for which it was done. Now, this says that intentionality is a feature understood in terms of explanation, which is a, perhaps a bit odd, <laughs> nonetheless. Um, the reasons for which it is done are not the same as the reasons why it is done. There's a different relation involved in those two cases. The reason why she did it was that she had forgotten. <laughs> that will not have been her reason for. <laughs> um, so watch the, pro watch the prepositions. Um, now it's... This general approach, an intentional action is an event explained in a certain way, has a, the metaphysical oddity that it links essence to explicability. Right. Metaphysics to something that doesn't sound metaphysical. The way we explain An intentional action is an action done for a reason and explained as such. And the sort of explanation we're dealing with, as I understand it, is normative rather than causal. I'm going to say more about that. Um, the explanation is effective to the extent that the reason you provide makes sense as a reason so to act. As a good reason, that is. <laughs> so you explain an action to the extent that you've shown that the reason for which it was done um, was or should be or could have been understood to be a good reason so to act. Um, now, the reason need not itself be distinct from the action and won't be when the action is done for its own sake. You don't need, if you like, a further reason to do it always. So, in that sense, you would explain the action not by mentioning the consequences of the action, shall we say, or the motive, other than just by pointing out that the action was done for its own sake. Um, to go running for the sake of it is not the same as to go running for no reason at all. Um, now, an alternative version of this general approach, an approach that understands action in terms of uh, uh, explaining it in a certain way, um, is what I call, what is called, the causal theory of action. And here it comes. An event is an action of A's, if and only if it's suitably caused by A's beliefs and desires. And that's the thesis I had in, in section one, in number, number one. Uh, however, many events that are caused by combinations of beliefs and desires of the agents are not actions. Um, for instance, a rise in blood pressure, a feeling of embarrassment, a blushing at being found out. That's an event caused by a combination of beliefs and desires, but it's not an action. It happens to you. You do it, but we would still say it wasn't an action. What sort of combinations of beliefs and desires are suitable to make the event they cause into an action? That's the sort of question you ask at this point. Um, 
Well, sort of trying to address that question, first, not all explanation of intentional actions appeals to the agent's reason for which, the reasons for which she did it. Um, for instance, you might say he did it because no alternative suggested itself to him. That's some kind of explanation of how it came about that he did it. But it's not an appeal to the agent's beliefs or desires. It's doing something else. Um, he did it because he felt like it, or on a whim, for no reason. It is possible to act in that sort of a way. Um, perhaps we might say, well, those are outliers, those sorts of examples. Let's not worry about them. The primary explanation of intentional action specifies the reasons for which it is done. And I do believe that. So that's what I'm sort of working with. Um, now, when we talk about the reasons for which an action is done, that doesn't look causal. For instance, the reason for which I act might be some fact about the future, but the future cannot cause the past or the present either. So explanations like that don't look like causal, but still we might say there must be a causal explanation somewhere around, if we can only locate it. Um, and here comes a classic theory. The reasons for which we act are our own psychological states functioning as causes. The reasons for which we act are our own psychological states, beliefs and desires of our own, not of other people's, functioning as causes. Um, I call that theory psychologism because it says that reasons are psychological states of the agent. Um, now, this theory is false. Um, most good reasons do not consist in psychological states of the agent. Um, I don't even need to argue for that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that it's about to rain is not a psychological state of the agent, but it's a good reason to get indoors. <laughs> yeah, that's the end of it. Okay. Um, so most good reasons, but plenty of them are psychological states of the agent. That I don't want to do something would be a reason for me not to do it, perhaps. But there's nothing special about that one. That it's about to rain is just as good a reason. <laughs> And one might act for that reason. Right? It's not a belief or desire, it's rain. Um, and one might even ask, is it possible really to act for a good reason conceived as beliefs and desires of your own? Sometimes, but there'll be special cases. Um, More normally, the things that count in favour of or against action are such things as that this will get you a lot of money or that it will enable you to please your parents. That looks like a good reason. It's nothing to do with beliefs and desires of yours. Um, so psychologism is false. The theory that maintains that the reasons for which we act are psychological states of our, of our own is simply wrong. Um, the reason for which I act is more likely to be her need for help than to be my believing that she needs help. Those are distinct reasons, and the former is much more likely to be the reason for which my, I act, being a reason for me so to act. Now, the reason why I helped might have been that I thought she needed help. And that's especially likely to have been the reason if she didn't need help. <laughs> um, after all, my believing that she needs help is not itself a reason to help. It's the, her need for help that's the reason. The believing that she needs help is a different reason and not the normal one for which I act. Um, perhaps, um, my belief, uh, my believing that I need help is part of the reason why I help. It's part of the explanation of my helping. Um, 
and my believing that she needs help can be part of what makes me blameworthy if I don't help. Yes. Um, so the mental states involved, these believings, um, do have a place in a story here. Um, and I want to accommodate that. Um, but I don't want the mental states to take center stage. What I want to have center stage is the reasons, which I'm distinguishing from mental states largely. Um, so the conception of rational explanation here, explanation of an action is done for a reason, um, is different from any notion of causal explanation. Um, reasons for which we act um, are sort of not themselves um, form causal forms of reasons why we act. Um, reason, one, one thing is reasons why we act must be the case. If you, the, something that is not the case cannot be a reason why somebody does something. Um, but I can act for a reason that is not the case. As when my reason for acting is that she needs help when she doesn't. <laughs> um, when I do so, I'm responding to her need for help as a reason. Now, I'm still keep stressing this as a reason bit because that's the crucial player in all this. Um, it's the reason's relation that it is at the core of the explanation of my doing what I do. I may believe that her need is a reason for me to help, um, but that belief is not itself an independent reason. The reason is the need for help, which is not a psychological state of me. Okay, so that's the first part of this talk. When do I start? <laughs> do we think? 20 past? Yeah. Yeah, right. that's, that's fine. That's fine. Um, <coughs> okay, so according to me, the pivotal relation in all this is the favoring relation, the relation of being a reason for. Um, you can you explain an action by specifying the reasons for which it was done. Um, those reasons are not restricted to psychological states of the agent or psychological states of you who's doing the explaining. When you explain the action, you mention such things as that it's about to rain. That's a perfectly good reason. Um, the sort of lurch to the psychological states is, is a mistake. It misplaces the role of those things in the total story. The pivotal relation, as I see it, is a normative relation, not a causal one. And that's what the rest of this talk is about. Um, there's a paper by Kieran Setia, who's a very clever man in the East Coast of America, um, which argues as follows. Um, Even if our reasons are not our own psychological states, he admits that, um, still, in order to act for the reason that P, or on the ground that P, or, uh, you must have certain psychological states, including believing that P, um, and you must have certain desires, and these states could be playing a causal explanatory role. They could be explaining your action. They could be the causes of the action. And all this is part of what it is to act for a reason. Of what it is to act for a reason, I sort of stress that, the metaphysics of acting for a reason. Um, this last bit is what he calls his stronger thesis. Um, it's a constitutive or metaphysical claim rather than a necessary condition. So it's not <coughs> you can't act for the reason that P unless you believe that P. That's true, but it's a stronger claim than that. It's the claim that part of what it was for you to act for that reason was your believing that P. So that's the metaphysical claim. It's part of, that's a metaphysical, it's like part of a cake, but it's not a cake. When we're dealing with part holes, we're doing this metaphysics. Um, 
The reason is the, according to him, the reason is the content of the states that cause the action. So the reason is what I want, for instance, where content is the thing wanted. The reason is what I believe, not my believing it. Um, what I wanted, not my wanting it. My wanting it's the cause. Now, I want against this, I want to say that desire is incapable of motivating. This may seem very strange to you, but on my account, to desire is to be motivated. Which I think on any account, really. <laughs> to desire is to be motivated, and therefore desire cannot be what motivates. Something else must be doing the motivation. So, to desire is to be motivated by something else. <laughs> by a prospect, for instance. Or by a need to apologize. Or... Hmm? Um, if desire is motivation, then... Um, we cannot really explain desire by appeal to motivation. It's too late. Um, if, desire, if, if, des if to desire is to be motivated, then desire cannot be what motivates. Something else must be doing the motivating thing. Um, and there's nothing left except belief. So this talk of belief and desire as combining mental states that lead to action is unstable. It makes it appear that desire and belief suitably combine to cause the action <laughs> as a third object. Um, but the belief-desire combination is not a combination of equals. The desire doesn't motivate. It is your being motivated. And I would say the belief doesn't motivate either. It's what you believe that motivates. <laughs> and what you believe is not a psychological state of yours. Motivation is a psychological state of you. <laughs> yes. But what motivates you is not itself a psychological state of you. It's something else that's having an effect on you, like his need for help or whatever it is. Um, so I agree, perhaps, with this claim. Belief and desire are necessary for intentional action. You cannot act intentionally unless you have appropriate beliefs and desires. Um, but the stronger thesis was that what it is to act for a reason is to act in a way that is caused by your beliefs and desires. That's what I reject. Partly because... Um, it really ascribes similar roles to belief and to desire, which I deny, partly because I think this causal story is wrong anyway. The crucial, the crucial hinge, the hinge notion here is acting for a reason, the normative relation, um, acting in the light of a consideration as a reason, and that notion of as a reason introduces the relation of favoring, where consideration favors responding one another. Um, to act because you desire that P need not be the same as to act it, uh, in order to make it the case that P. Um, for instance, I might stay away from... Oh, this, I hope you won't object to this example. I might stay away from a woman because I want very much to be with her, but she doesn't want to have anything to do with me. And our interactions are very painful. So my reason here uh, is that I want to be with her, but I'm not acting so as to make it the case that I am with her. I act in order to prevent myself from being with her because it's so uncomfortable. Um, I got to 15 on the sheet. <laughs> Note that one's reason is not likely to be the content of a desire either. And the first question is, do all desires have a content? 
or is it just belief? How, how should we understand the notion of what we desire? Um, the content of a belief might be a proposition, and the content of a desire is not likely to be that. Um, is there such a thing as an infinitival content for a desire? I desire to run. Is that a content? What is it then that I desire when I desire that P? I certainly don't desire a proposition. Now I'm going to say something about this tomorrow, right, so we can relax for a while. But it will come back to bite us. In a way, the crucial debates that I'm interested in are um, 16. <laughs> um, whether the operative relation in acting for a reason is normative or causal. Um, what is the pressure to put a causal relation into the story? We respond to reasons as reasons, and our physical mental, mental equipment is such as to make that sort of response possible. One thing we don't want to do is to tell a story about this which is incompatible with the way in which we seem to explain it. Um, Satya talks of a certain causal explanatory role for certain psychological states. But, of course, we must forget that there's already a way it works, which is neurological. We've got a causal story of how it comes about that this body is moving around, which is neurological. It's to do with events in the brain. And we plaster on top of that another causal story, which is about psychological states having effects on us. And nobody knows how to run these two stories together. Um, Now, the neurophysiological story that I just mentioned is, of course, um, causal, but not exactly explanatory. And that's basically because nobody knows how to tell the story of, ho of how changes in the brain are related to action. Uh, this is one of the sort of tough points in the philosophy of action, isn't it? But, mo but it looks as if we have these two causal stories, the neurological and the non-neurological, <laughs> the psychological. And we, sh we, you know, as philosophers, it's our job to notice this, and to sort of not to allow one story to get the credit that the other has. There must be a neurological account of how action works, though nobody knows how it works. And if it did know, it wouldn't help. Um, Seventeen. So we know there's a causal story involved, a neurophysiological one. Uh, perhaps it's not explanatory, it's only causal. Um, but basically we're asked to accept a three-level picture. Neurological, psychological, both of these are causal, and then normative, the reason. Uh, and all these things are in play with an intentional action. Um, now, could it be that responding to the reason that P as a reason so the normativity of the thing is in focus, um, could just be being caused to act by believing that P. Well, we might demand more than brute causation here. When I blush being found out in indecent behavior, an example I've already used, I think, um, I am caused to blush by awen my awareness of having been found out. But this is not the same thing as blushing for a reason. I have a reason to blush, but that prob isn't, probably isn't the explanation of my blushing. Um, what would we need to add to the blushing to get blushing for a reason? Well, I'd have to be responding to a consideration as favoring that sort of response. That's what makes it intentional, as it were. Um, when you act, um, Oh, sorry, I'm at, I'm at 18. Merely being caused to act by believing that things are so is not sufficient for um, acting for a reason. Now, Satya introduces a causalized form of the for the reason that relation. And he calls it because and then a capital R. 
where it's a kind of rational because. So when you catch flu, you catch flu because you were near somebody who had flu. That's a non-normative because. When you give someone helping hand, you act because they need help. That's a normative because. It's a for the reason that. Or, um, in my words, in the light of that as a reason. Uh, now, what Satya tries to do is introduce a causalized form of for the reason that. Um, because with a capital R after it. It's a rational sort of because. So it's causal and rational at once. Um, what he says is, um, when someone acts because R, P, or on the ground that P, or in order to F, one must have some relevant psychological state, knowledge, belief, desire, one of those. Um, and this state plays what he calls a causal explanatory role in what one is doing, or in one's doing what one's doing. But this doesn't establish a constitutive claim that what it is to act for a reason is to be caused to act by certain psychological states of one's own. Um, and it doesn't establish that the reasons for which we act are our psychological states. Um, So what Satya is trying to suggest is that we can accept a causal account of acting for a reason without accepting a general causal theory of action. I want to work the other way around. I want a causal theory of action. To act is to cause a change. Um, but I don't want a causal theory of acting for a reason since I don't think the relevant relation is causal. It's normative. Um, Satya is impressed by the relation between three supposedly necessary truths, which are on your sheet, I hope. Um, one, if A is doing F because R, P, A is doing F because she knows that P. Two, if A is doing F on the grounds that P, A is doing F because she believes that P. Three, if A is doing F in order to P, a is doing F because she wants to V. So here we have knows, believes, wants. These are psychological states. Uh, and what we got, we got there for are supposedly metaphysical truths that link action to psychological states. Um, so for instance, Satya says what it is to do F on the grounds that P, to run on the grounds that it's about to rain, is to do F because one believes that P. Um, now, what he says is, this: that what sort of because is at issue here? Because one believes that P. What sort of because is that? This is another of the not so little words, but little words that you have to make sure you watch. Um, well, he wants a very basic because, which is not the sort of in the light of that I think of as central to the explanation of action. Um, there are cases, Donald Davidson has the, introduced the idea of a, a deviant case where um, someone is going climbing with a friend who he intends to murder by letting go of the rope at a certain point. And when the point comes, he gets so nervous that he lets go of the rope by mistake and the friend is killed. Now, what made him nervous was the beliefs and desires he had at the time. He thought, think, what am I going to do? So, um, so he, he was... And he let go of the rope because he had those beliefs and desires. But that's not a rational because. Those weren't the reasons for which he let go of the rope. He let go of the rope by mistake. But the mistake was caused by his beliefs and desires. Now, this is a deviant sort of because in the sense that it doesn't get you to the rational because that we really want to understand. 
when somebody acts f for the reason that it's about to rain, he acts because it's about to rain. This is the non -nor this is the, the non deviant because. <laughs> but if your mental states cause you to let go of the rope, then this is a merely causal relation. It's not an intentional relation. They're not responding to something as a reason. They don't know none of those lovely things. It's merely causal. Now, Satya's becauses are all like that. And that, of course, seems to me as hopeless as an, the sort of basic part of an attempt of what it is to act for a reason. Um, as I say at the end of 21, um, this weak because seems inadequate to sustain a claim about what it is to act for a reason for the reason that P or on the grounds that P or something like that. Um, Davidson always assumed that we need an analysis of the because in he did it because. It's not mere cause and effect. It's something cleverer. Um, my view is that the on the grounds that relation, when we act on the grounds that P, is primitive and inexplicable. Um, I allow that if you act on the grounds that P, you must believe that P, but do nothing to say why this must be so, except, well, um, except in my appeal to the phrase, in the light of. Um, if you can appeal to that phrase, I'm at 23. Um, um, to, to V in the light of the putative fact that P is partly to suppose that the fact that P casts V in a favorable light and to act in that light. So this in the light of relation is itself normative. Um, and it requires belief or recognition. So on my account then, when I act despite its being the case that P, um, I'm not acting in the light of the fact that P, even though the fact that P is in my headlights, as it were. I've got it in mind, and I, my action I is sort of affected by it. But I'm not acting for that as a reason. I'm nearly finished. Um, two, new, two more points. Um, first, what is the logical structure of a reason not to V, not to go to the party? Is it different from a reason against going to the party? Um, is there a gap between favoring not going to the party and disfavoring going to the party? Um, is there even such an action as not going to the party? Well, yes, perhaps there is. Um, but the, many of the things that I'm not doing, for instance, I'm not flying to Moscow at the moment, are not actions of mine. So we must be careful about our negatives here. Um, Final point with to do with Satya. Uh, if A is doing F on the grounds that P, he says, A is doing F because she believes that P. So it's because, believes. You know. And he asks, what could explain the truth of this? And offers three options. One, a causal psychological theory which explains what it is to act on the ground that P in terms of acting because one believes that P. Um, in a sense that's applicable to deviant cases. Um, two, taking the because as irreducible and rational. Because she believes that P. Um, I.e. it's a because that doesn't apply to the deviant cases and is effectively inexplicable. And that's the position I take. I think that when you act in the light of a consideration as a reason, you take that consideration to favor responding as you do, 
and you act in that light. Um, there is nothing that can be said further about that. Causal versions don't work, and there is nothing else that presents itself as a possible explanation. Um, essentially, there is the favoring relation, where a consideration favors responding in a certain way, and we act in the light of that, and those are the basic players in my story. There's nothing beneath that. So there's something there, the in the light of relation, when you act in the light of consideration as a reason, um, which is essential to the sorts of explanation we give of intentional actions, but which I don't think we can say anything to explain. So on that disappointing note, I'm going to end. Thank you for listening to me. We have time for questions. Uh, we have a microphone here, so please raise your hand and I will give you the microphone. Um, any questions? So while you are... So there, we have one question. Jakob? I think you probably have to press here, so... Is it on? Yeah. Uh, so, thanks for your talk. And I'm a bit nervous that you, you're going to say that you, there's nothing more to be said, but could you shine some more light on the uh, in, light, in the light of relation? Uh, so perhaps something negative is what, what I have in mind. So how sort of top of mind does P have to be in order for me to act in the light of? So say that I'm a very experienced football mm. player. Mm. Uh, and I do something football-y. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but it's not that it's sort of top of mind, but I still sort of, in one sense, act in light of yeah. the football-y feature. Um, well, a minimal sense, yes. Um, as minimal as it can be, I suppose I might say. Um, a footballer is, I mean, this is, shall we say, the dodge when you, you know, um, they must be aware of the situation um, to which the dodge is an appropriate response. Um, and must, if you like, in responding to it, um, do what seems appropriate to the case. Now, those are very long words for a very short thing. Um, the, you know, I don't want at all to intellectualize this, if I possibly can. Though obviously, there are many cases where it is fully intellectual, there's no problem. Um, but still, you need something to respond to, and you need to adjust your behavior to that, the, the thing that you're responding to. And this is making it happen very fast, and isn't verbal. Or, um, but still, um, you know, one of the, I would say one of the things about being a good footballer is that you can do this stuff extremely fast, where the rest of us can't. Um, now, I, I can see that uh, sort of in your mind is the thought that it's going to get terribly intellectual. Um, but this is because we're trying to think about something which is not itself intellectual, um, but. Um, what, I mean, if the question is, what is the fact for a reason? Does the footballer act for a reason? Yes, she does. Um, does she know why she's doing it? Probably there's not time for that. Um, but that's what it is to be a good footballer. You're up, you're up, you can do this thing without thinking, one might say. Still, um, I, I would say that um, they are, she is doing what she's doing as the way to go. Um, that's a sort of the, sm the shortest words I can find. <laughs> I mean, what do you think about that? Is it just still too intellectualized? No, no, no. Uh, I, I was hoping for that type of answer. That it's it's a very minimal sense that's required to act in in light of some fact. It doesn't need need that much. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be fairly normal. This in the light of relation, otherwise it fails to cover the ground. Um, so. It, and it, it can be made as heavyweight as you like by reflection and so on. Um, 
you know, um, you might say it's mere instinct. And uh, there is a point, of course, at which it, the, something ceases to be rational choice or done for a reason. It simply is learn, a learnt, learnt behaviour, uh, where um, you know it isn't really done for a reason at all. But I mean, the difficulty of distinguishing that from you know sort of simplest possible versions of the rational one don't seem to me need to cause me to you know worry too much. Um, the uh, yeah, that's enough. That's, I can't think of anything else to say. <laughs> okay, we have Ingwer. Yeah, <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, once upon a time, quite long ago now, I <coughs> read about the stuff in philosophy of action called the problem of basic actions. So uh, someone tells me, ask me, turn on the light. Well, can I just turn on the light? Is that a basic action or am I just pulling the switch? Is that a basic action? So now my simple, I like to talk very much. Now, <coughs> now my simple question is, do <coughs> the kind of uh, analysis of actions that you have put forward have imply a special answer to this question of are there basic actions? Um, well, I always think of a basic action, oh, thank you, sorry. Um, I always think of a basic action as an action that you do and that you don't do by doing something else, as it were. Yeah. Um, and I don't see any reason why I shouldn't say there are plenty of those. Um, the question why I do them has an answer. Um, but and the but the answer need not appeal to other actions of mine. It could be th the, why do I do it? Uh, uh, bec because, to turn the light off on, to turn the light on. Um, it's a basic action, but it has a perfectly good explanation. Something in your face gives me to understand that that is not going to go well. <laughs> <laughs> Is, he looks like that. is <laughs> turning on the light a basic action? Sometimes, yes. Okay, mm. what then are the actions that I... What do you call the actions that I need to do in order to uh, switch on the light, to pull the switch? All oh, right. Um, look, I don't need to have a, a foot in this debate, um, but I'm willing to enter it. Into, into it for the sake of it, but I don't not sure. I don't see the answer to this affects the things I've been trying to say particularly t today, um, because I'm talking about reasons, and you're talking about the structure of basic and non-basic within the notion of action. Yeah, but so my question was then: Do your reflections about reason mm -hmm. uh, push one one way rather than another? Uh, say something mm -hmm. about what we should call basic actions. That was. I see. Uh, is this still, have I got this? Yeah. Um, um, I'm not convinced that it makes a difference. Um, I'm thinking that um, some basic actions will not, well, there can be unintentional basic actions. If it's unintentional, then it was not done for a reason in the sense that I'm talking about. Um, so these, all these difficult questions about acting for reasons would not apply to such basic actions. Um, so the two debates do not meet. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you, Jonathan. It was difficult to but so <coughs> this one thing I wonder about, this kind of the role of normativity in this. So I, I perfectly agree that uh, when I'm doing something for a reason and uh, for example I'm helping her because she needs help right mm -hmm. so there's a normative element uh, in the sense that uh, I must consider the fact that she needs help as something that favors uh, helping her right yes but this doesn't mean that uh, doing something for a reason is something normative, right? It's rather that 
uh, it involves yeah. certain Norm psychological states uh -huh. that uh, have the content which is of normative nature, right? Yes. So that's not uh, yet uh, saying that doing something for a reason is uh, is something normative, right? Yes. It's rather that there's room for normativity in the content of of the psychological states that are necessary for doing something for a reason. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I agree that um, I cannot just say that the action is to say that do, to do something for a reason is that is to have those psychological states that simply cause the action because then I get the problem of deviant cases. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I tend to agree that when I, I do something on the ground mm. that she needs help, right, then this is maybe kind of primitive and uh, uh, in not far explicable. But it's still not normative, right? So, so normativity, I would say, is only in the content of, of the necessary uh, psychological states, but, but the, the, the doing something for a reason is not a normative relation, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, let me. Try. Okay. Um, doing something for a reason is not a normative relation. Um, it is a relation, um, and the relation is between what you do and the reason for which you do it. I'm just sort of running through it to see if we get the players in the. Um, so, um, doing something for a reason, there is the reason for which you do it and there's what you do. And the for in there is where I, what I'm after, what we're both after. Um, the reason why, now that why would be mere explanation and is not therefore normative, except in the sense that explanation is normative. Yeah. Um, but if it, if it were not a re if it were in addition to being a reason why, a reason for which, well that seems to me that's the point at which normativity enters. But, but what I mean is that we need this kind of the reason why here, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason why in this case has to do with certain kind of um, psychological states that have normative content, right? And so this is. A, I'm doing something for a reason, right? Yeah. But the problem is, and I think that I, I, I agree with you totally here, that those psychological states cannot simply be said to be causing, right, the, 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 the action, because that would not solve the, the problem of deviant cases. But, yeah. but still, it's some kind of relation which itself is not normative, but it's rather that it sort of involves yes. certain that's states it, that's, that, that's that what have the, normative that, content. That's where I want to be. Okay, I keep trying to be there. I mean, in a way, the question is, what is the nature of the because? Um, and we sort of, everyone is thinking, this is not mere basic causality. There's something more interesting going on. Um, and. Of course, I can be caused to act. Be I, said I acted because he was in trouble or something. Um, and that might be mere causation, or it could be that that was my reason. Um, and I think you're agreeing with me that if, if, it, if it is my reason, there's, if you like, uh, there's something normative floating about here. <laughs> I'm getting as vague as I possibly can in order to stay alive, right? Um, that something normative floating about here, and then the question is, sort of, where are we to locate that bit? And I'm trying to say that um, the agent is responding to this consideration as a reason. And once you've got that as in there, if you like, essentially, um, it's possible to say, you're responding to a consideration as counting in favor of that response was so responding, I should say, put it more generally. Um, now, I still feel that you don't want to allow me to say that. <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> all right, you would, prefer it, you would prefer it if I didn't say that. Um, the, 
I, uh, it seems, I mean, a sort of basic phenomenon here is sometimes features of the situation seem, present themselves to me as calling for somebody, somebody in front of you trips and falls down and you just don't hesitate, you, and you don't say to yourself how many reasons have I got or, you know, am I, so you just do it. Um, and you, one might say, let's not uh, pretend that there's something normative going on, it's a sort of immediate response. And sometimes that could be so. You know, you just, it is, you, but most of the time there'll be something normative where you, you know, I need to stop. So I can't just walk on. I can't need this normative notion. You know. um, now I'm just thinking that um, when you respond to something as, as a reason, um, you know, it, sorry. Uh, yes, well, when you, no. You would agree that when you respond to something as a reason, the normativity is, if you like, in your headlights. Um, and there are occasions when you, as it were, just respond and the normativity isn't in your headlights. <laughs> Though we might say um, you are responding as a kind person would or something like that. But that's not, if you like, what's happening in the, on the ground. What's happening is that this person is lying there and you're just helping. Um, now, I suppose I'm hearing you as saying, let's not ov make over elaborate the most basic direct responses like this. No? Okay. Okay. I'm. Let's not over intellectuals. No. No. I was thinking of the kind of uh, cases where y you really kind of think, well, this calls for a certain for certain response, mm. right? So there's uh, right. you okay. need to, uh, needs uh, mean that you ought to do a certain thing, right? Yes, so there's mm. lots of normativity involved, but this normativity is involved in your thoughts about the case. It's not, they are not involved in the relation between oh, right. your thoughts okay. and, the, and, and your action. Well, okay. This is not a normative relation, but, but of course, the thoughts of normative nature. Okay. Yes. Look, I think this is where my realism comes in, really. I think you're not as realist as I am. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I think that um, you know, there can be sort of non-grand normative relations, which the, the, acting for a reason is not very grand, really. I mean, that like duties and obligations and all that stuff. Um, responding to a consideration as favoring sounds a little bit elaborate. <laughs> right. um, but um, doing what you have reason to do, <laughs> nothing much is, nothing, you don't need to think about the word, you don't need to, nothing, but you are s still, um, there will be cases where you just do it. <laughs> And there'll be other cases where, sort of as close to that as you could possibly get, um, where y you are um, responding to the situation appropriately. And you don't have to think this is appropriate. I'm trying to get that little bit of normativity in just at the... Um, we agree about that. All right, um, but you're trying to get me to agree that there's also a case where is, there isn't a normative part of the story, really. The whole thing is done um, as one ought. Or what, what when you do something for reason, you can act appropriately or you can act inappropriately. Right? Yes. In this way, there is, of course, room for normative assessment. Yeah, that, of course. That's, yeah, that's but that, yeah, but that, that was assessment from outside, yes. where somebody said, how well did Vodek respond yeah. to this tricky yeah. situation? Yeah. You know, yes. um, student but in that, tears. But so. that's not what you were talking You were talking about the, the, this acting for a reason, yeah. whether this is normative or not. I do. I, I'm, still th I'm still thinking that... Um, uh, uh, no, this is a, like normativity light. Um, <laughs> uh, it's as thin as it gets, but I, st I still want to say that um, there will, of course, be the cases where it is, it's an unmediated response. You just respond. And then there will be you know, just the other side of that. Um, 
there will be the sense that you're responding to this as, and then you get the representations and the normativity is coming in. But I don't, um, I don't think I ever needed to say, to deny the possibility of an unmediated, that of somebody responding as they should, but not because they should, or, or for reasons. Or not. Okay, thank you. Well, there's good pressure. You push me. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I mean, we need to move on. Uh, Monica? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I guess my question is somehow related. And I'm curious to hear what you would make of so-called expressive actions. So let's suppose your talk made, made me really angry. Mm -hmm. And I walk up and take this vase mm -hmm. and smash it against the wall mm -hmm. out of anger. Mm -hmm. So it seems that this is clearly an intentional action. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem to be an action I can make sense of in light of reasons. Or what would those reasons be? Um, okay. I haven't thought about this. Um, <laughs> We know why you're doing it, because you've told me why you're doing it, because you're so angry. Right. Um, but that isn't the, your reason for doing it. Right. Um, uh, your reason for doing it was, it could have been that it made you so angry, I suppose, or it could have been the dreadful talk. Oh, sorry, the angry-making talk. Perhaps it was a very good talk, but it was angry-making. Exactly. goes against <laughs> my grain of well, something was Davidsonianism, it, yeah. right. I suppose. It was non-cognitivist again, all that stuff. <laughs> Whatever. <coughs> um, well, uh, Because I have a feeling hmm. intentional action can come apart from actions done for, uh, yeah. done for yeah. a reason. Mm -hmm. okay. And I wonder mm -hmm. if okay. there is room in mm -hmm. your picture for that coming a part of inten intentional action and action uh, uh, that I mean, we do look, for yeah. a reason or, in, uh, or this in light of which consideration? Mm -hmm. Okay, I've always tended to say that intentional actions are, int are actions done for reasons. Yeah. But that, I mean, what you're pointing out is that um, there are reasons why it was done, but they're not reasons for which it was done. Um, and I w obviously, when I'm thinking about reasons, I've normally got the reasons for which no, locution in, the head, mm. in my head rather than the reasons why, which are mm. too many. Mm -hmm. um, uh, okay, so what's the sharp edge of this question then? Um, well, because you seem to make this distinction between intentional actions which are always done for a reason mm -hmm. and the why explanation which is merely causal. Yeah. Now these expressive actions seem so to be actions that so are done intentionally but maybe mm. not for a reason. So my question is where mm. do they fall in your okay. picture? Would you say they're not intentional actions at all, which I find a bit no. counterintuitive? Mm -hmm. Or would you say they are intentional actions but you know, the reasons for which mm -hmm. we act in these kinds mm -hmm. of expressive mm -hmm. cases need to be explained in some different way. Okay. And, and maybe okay, I think that's the okay. road you so would I mean, want I to imagine, yeah, I can imagine myself saying, you know, they say, why do you do that? I say, well, it's such a terrible talk. Yeah. And you kept making the most awful jokes <laughs> yeah, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, that's why I did it. And, and you say, you think to yourself, well, that does, isn't a good reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and then you thought, is, well, it, it, it wasn't supposed to be a good reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was why I did it. Mm -hmm. um, but then, of course, it's a special sort of why I did it. There are all sorts of other why I did it, which are not the same as that one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, if one said, the, the talk made me angry and um, I felt like smashing a, va a vase, Vase. And um, so, you know, these things are not unconnected. <laughs> um, the, am I to think that, um, I, in addition to that, I've got to have some thought about reasons? <laughs> no. I would have thought, as you're quite right in thinking, that uh, no, no such thought needs, occur, <laughs> needs to occur. Um, why did you do it? That was such a dreadful talk, and I had to do something. <laughs> Um, all right. I mean, I think I just say, yes, this is a phenomenon. Okay. Um, now, if I do that, what happens um, to the larger picture, as it were? That's the crucial bit. 
Um, why, why can I just add a phenomenon? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there are going to be all sorts of strange phenomena which I haven't talked about, which I should also add. Um, what difference would it make to the, the general thesis picture that I've been offering if one allows that further um, mm -hmm. um, phenomenon? Uh, well, um, I started by talking about um, intentional actions. So in a sense, I might say, I'm talking about the intentional actions. And if you can find another category, I don't, you know, I don't feel that I have to say anything about them other than to demarcate them. Mm -hmm. So I might say that, or I might try saying, and this is me just working out the options because I don't have a prepared text for this. Right? <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, might, I might say um, uh, that is a phenomenon, mm -hmm. and it, um, I don't mean by I mean it, you know, it's a thing we have to ac account for. Uh, the uh, if one said you only have two tools in your weaponry in your toolbox, one is normativity and the other is causation, and this appears to be neither. Um, uh, would you be tempted to say that? I'm not sure. Um, okay, I you don't have to answer that question. I just wanted to know. <laughs> uh, it's, you're, you're asking questions. I, I'm not allowed to. I'm not <laughs> cheating. Um, the, uh, uh, there clearly are causal relations involved. Um, it might be that it seems to you perfectly appropriate to act in, in that way, but that doesn't seem to me to be an essential part of what's going on. Mm. Even if it mm. did, it would be a luxury, as it were. Um, there is a why you do it, why you, there is an account of why you're doing it. Um, I suppose I find myself thinking that the the. The in the light of relation does not apply to this. Mm -hmm. um, it does, it's like it's packed into that. Something, some thoughts about appropriateness or something like that are packed into it. And the sense in which the smashing of the vase is appropriate isn't that sense. Mm -hmm. um, it isn't you don't present it <coughs> to, to yourself as you know in that way. But in that, in the in the distinct distinct sense of appropriateness, it's utterly appropriate to kick the wall and <laughs> uh, do all those things that one does in theory. But, uh, um, uh, okay, I mean, one of the troubles with uh, analyses that offer you some boxes <laughs> is that there's always the little bit in the um, you know where the suit sort of in between, mm -hmm. and I have as it were, the rational and the merely causal, shall we say. And you're pointing out that there's, there's a sort of little dodgy, dodgy bit in there, um, which is doesn't appear to want to be in either of my two boxes. And the boxes are so set up that nothing can be in both. Right. Yeah, OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I hope I now have got the order right. I think it was Patrick, then Inga. Uh, please help <coughs> me if I've, I've got it wrong here. And then Jakob. Uh, you won, I mean, sorry. Uh. Hi. Uh, so I wanted to go to uh, point three about an action being an agent's causing a change. Oh, yeah. Um, I suppose that didn't play much of a, a role afterwards, but mm. I wanted to ask about it anyway. Mm. Um, and then something about this appeal to difference making. So, yeah, I was wondering why, why do you why are you attracted to this change idea, um, or it's an, an action in, it's an agent's causing a change? I, mean, I guess uh, it doesn't seem. Um, a crazy thing to think, but you'll run into case uh, problems about overdetermination and um, preemption, things like that. So, like, I don't know. I'm, yeah. I press a button to cause the avalanche to, you know, yeah. or an explosion which causes an avalanche to go blow, you know, destroy a city. But you know, at the same time, some uh, different avalanche was also coming coming down a different mountain. 
destroying the you know also destroys the city and in some sense I mean I maybe I didn't ca cause a change in the sense you know to the city's status but I I don't know I caused something or I I I, I did something I performed an action yeah you know. <clears throat> look I mean really what I should do is agree that this is difficult mm -hmm. right so that's why I call it a working hypothesis yeah. you've got your sense I got to say something about something mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, I don't. I call it a working hypothesis for the very reason that I am not at all sure it's something that I mm. can defend. But it's a, something to, to be going along with. Um, so I want to uh, just allow that there are all these issues about preemption and joint and one thing yeah, over yeah. over determination. Yeah. That's what, that's, what, that's mm. the right word. Yes, I I I, I know about that. Um, but I, that's why I called it a working hypothesis. I, um, the, I mean, in a way, you might say, I don't need particularly to have that, make that hypothesis, because yeah. the things I do want to talk about are not much effect affected by that. Yeah. Um, um, so it's, um, nonetheless, you know, I mean, I've got three talks to give, and um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I, I have to sort of put something on the ground. That, so that's what I was doing. Um, I, did I say I got I learnt this from a paper by Alvarez and Hyman? I don't remember, but that's where I got it from. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me the best of a bad lot. Basically. That's not. I know that in philosophy, that's not perhaps a very proper thing to say. <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> well, hello there. Hello. Uh, thank you for an intriguing talk. Mm. Excellent. So <coughs> I was, I'm, I'm sort of returning to the first question about this related, or it's not related, but that's what sort of caused my mm. question, <laughs> the one with the football and the, the way ah. to go, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about, and you, you were talking about the rational choice that you make and basic yeah. having these reasons and then instinctive behavior. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about experts or expertise mm -hmm. and that not as something tacit, but mm -hmm. actually knowledge that you can verbalize, but perhaps you're not verbalizing it all the time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, thinking about the potter who is throwing clay Oh, Potter, yeah, sorry. The Potter, Pot yes. <laughs> I heard you say the Potter. Potter. The Potter no, no, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the Potter who's throwing clay. And um, how are you thinking about the reasons in that case? I mean, because while you're doing this, uh, obviously there are, there, are, there are lots of decisions being made, but at the same time there has to be some kind of rock bottom, I suppose, <laughs> for I when it's not useful to talk about reasons, maybe. Uh, right and at the same time, there mm -hmm. may also be uh, these deviant things yeah. uh, happening. Okay, one thing at a time, perhaps. Yes. Um. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, the potter... So the potter has a competence, um, just like we all you know, um, and doesn't think twice about a lot of stuff. Um, you know, you take a lump of clay and you throw it on in the way that you have to throw it. No, you don't take that. No, okay, I that's don't, wrong. No, really. no, because mo most of them think a lot, uh, at least uh, I've been studying this. Okay, <laughs> so but if the more they think, the think easier it is for me. I mean, <laughs> yeah. as, soon as, they, as soon as they start thinking, I'm up and running. I thought, sorry, if you see what I mean. Um, the, 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 I thought the problem. You started off by mentioning the football or something. Yeah, no, 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 that was okay. course my question, okay, well, but it's not the same right. question. Okay, well, I think I must ask you to ask it again in that case. Ask it again. Yeah, no, so I'm quite kind of interested in because I think there are choices being made, but is there a rock bottom, you know, when you, when the, how thin can these reasons be? Because ah. it's a very mm. quick process. Yeah. That's one, one problem in this, or maybe mm. not a problem, but I'm just interested in how you look at this. And then also the question about the, the deviant causal chains, because of course there is a lot of knowledge going in here and there is a lot of you know, mm. verbal talk and discourse throughout the years that people are doing this. It takes about, I think, 15 years to learn to do it well, so they I say. Talk, yeah. uh, mm. Yes, and, and they talk a lot about this. And so, what about how do you how do you handle then the deviant course of change? So that's really those two questions that I'm interested. in. Okay, um, myself, I don't handle deviant causal chains because I don't do causal chains. Ah, okay. Um, so I'm I, I'm not into causal chains. Yeah, you don't think there is a, that problem wouldn't uh, sort of get in there? That's a no. I, I mean yes, whichever it is. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, that, I think, I, look, I don't see that the problem of deviant causal chains applies to this case. Okay. It, I don't mean by that there isn't a problem about deviance, but it's not the problem of deviant causal chains. It's okay, the problem yes. of deviant something right. else. Okay. So, but th can you ask the question in a way that doesn't, uh, that talks about deviance and not about causal chains? Yes, yes. <clears throat> I just, uh, well, let's go back to the other one about the micro decisions <laughs> instead and see right, how, okay. how, where is there a uh, sort of a level where it doesn't, make sense anymore to talk about the reasons no. because it's a very quick process well you could always you can always ask the question yeah and there will come a point where there won't be an answer but um, so so suppose that the process is uh, like one minute long but there are lots of lot micro decisions yeah. so there could be like i think don't of, know thousands of, of reasons yeah. in two yeah think of playing a violin mm. um there yeah. you are playing away you know in enormous subtlety and complexity in your fingers, mm. your your right hand, you know, the brain, the mind, all these things. Yeah, and position, um, how you sit and yeah, uh, how and you breathe at the same so, time so, and all that. Yeah. You know, and you say, okay, now how, what, you know, um, yeah, how, you know, what, what are the sticking points here? Um, now you might say, uh, the, there is a basic competence which people have, which they don't need to pay any attention to at all. They can just do it. So you play your major scale and so on. Um, if you sort of, the, for the agent, it's just one action, really. It has the duration, but it's, you know, it's, it's within the competence. So they don't need a plan, they just do it. Uh, is, is that sort of a thing you're thinking of? No, no. Uh, well, no, I don't, I don't know what I'm thinking. I'm just interested to hear what you're saying. <laughs> so so I'm, I think everything you've said so far is interesting, <laughs> oh, pointing gosh. in different uh, directions. Right. So. Well, um, uh. I mean, I th you know, as it were, the reasons here don't need to carve things very fine. So, I mean, the, you know, the competent musician, <laughs> you set them off, play the a, B flat major scale, whatever it is, and the, you know, they play it. It's, a, it's in a way a single, perf single action which has parts. And they might say that sort of those parts are part of the action, but they're not independent. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's always very, very hard to do the independent bits. But from a metaphysical point of view, excuse me, but then you can carve it into... Yes, you can if you like cut it up. Days, yeah, you can cut it up like that. But from the point of view of the action, it's not an action that has duration is not therefore mm. one whose parts are... Um, conceived separately by the agent as actions or ones for which is appropriate to ask for reasons. The reasons might, as you like, look at it from above. Um, you know, uh, w sort of how, if you allowed the questions to continue to apply, no matter how small the, the phase of the behavior that you are offered, um, you have you. So I feel you're bound to get to a point where the question, "What are the reasons for which you did that?" have sort of that's not the right question. The focus has gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, on, but if I mean, and there are other aspects like you know, if you use vibrato at the beginning of each note but not through it, things like that. So I used to do those things. Um, <coughs> And if you said, why do you do that? The answer, I think, in my case, would have been, I didn't know I was doing it. But I would have known originally when I was learning how to do it. And I can remember now why it is that one does it. <laughs> and that's why I'm doing it, I suppose. But I don't think about that. I just do it. Um, but now we're, down, we're in a way down to routines again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, exactly. That's mm. what I, I was thinking about the other part. But uh, yeah. I agree that there are routines in Yeah. All right. Well, thanks anyway. I well, it didn't really do terribly well, but <laughs> okay. You won. Thanks. I think this uh, question is uh, related to the one that Monica uh, posed earlier. But I was thinking of very different kind of decisions that are much less um, emotional. I mean, sort of more d cases of picking. picking so pick picking. So I I'm, I enter this room. I need to sit somewhere. Mm -hmm. I pick a seat. Mm -hmm. Maybe my reason for doing it is it's nearby or mm -hmm. um, something very small. So these are kind of like tiebreaker reasons for choosing something or picking something. But it, anyway, it is an intentional action. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't seem to be any kind of 
appropriateness involved or sense of appropriateness involved. No. <coughs> it doesn't seem normative. So, so I mean, where this leads me, and also with your exchange with Monica, is that sometimes it sounds like we're, when we're talking about these reasons in the light of um, doing this kind of work of in the light mm. of, we are talking about sense making rather than something normative. I mean, these two may perhaps overlap, but I mean, I think dividing things up just between rational explanation and causal explanation might be to cut things a bit too crudely. Sort of too crudely. That there might be a sense-making explanation, I mean, verstehen, mm -hmm. um, that we are engaged with in, uh, in doing action explanation. And these kinds of reasons that we cite mm -hmm. are ones which, in light of something makes sense. So even, I mean, the kind of angry mm. example, mm. Uh, when you hear that this person was really upset by those jokes, mm. okay, I mean, you can, you've kind of made sense of what happened, even if uh, uh, you don't approve. So, so how about cutting things a bit differently? <laughs> well, differently is one thing, and more finely is another. Um, yeah. I mean, in a way, you're not objecting to the, to the cuts I have made. So no, much as no, so much as no. saying that there are more cuts to be made, I think, um, yeah. which is of course the sort of comment one wants rather than <laughs> doesn't doesn't want. Um, but the you know it, it's very important to, to you know to 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 find the right example to press the point. Um, so I mean, was the point was the was the example of choosing a seat as you come into the lecture theatre? As it were? I mean, I think there can be. M Many types of examples, but I think the, the, the common structure if the, is of them is that there will be a feature that serves as kind of an arbitrary, or more or less arbitrary tiebreaker. It, uh, it was the nearest one or something. Something like that. And it can yeah. be just like a thought that comes to your head. Yeah. It, you're, you're kind of just relieved yeah. to, to, right. to, to, yeah. to be able to pick. I mean, it might be like this, that we know why you picked a seat. If we said, why did he pick this seat? The answer was, it was the nearest one. That's the probable explanation. Do we need to suppose that that thought even entered his head? No. Um, do we need to suppose that he picked this seat for a reason beyond the fact that it was a suitable seat, as it were, which is given? No, we don't. But the sort of if and we said, well, there got to be an explanation of why he picked this seat, um, and I think I would say probably. Um, I suppose I would have to say yes, grudgingly. Um, but it won't be one of the explanations I'm trying to offer. Um, picking and choosing. Remember those people used to distinguish between picking and choosing? Um, was that? Did you? No. Um, <laughs> was that? Yeah, that's, that's what it was. Picking yeah. and choosing. Yes, right, a long time ago. Um, 70s. It's true, isn't it? Yeah. What an awful fact. Yes. Um, Picking and that's right. Picking, um, uh, and this was part of the point, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, I don't have an answer to those questions. Um, uh, the uh, the crucial question for me is: Is there normativity in this? Really, I suppose. And um, you know, with picking. The whole thought was, um, there is a reason to pick, but no reason to pick this. But that's not a reason not to pick it. <laughs> um, we can we we can sometimes explain why this was picked in a non-normative way. It was the nearest one, or something, <laughs> or it, it crossed her mind, or it it struck her. Um, but that isn't the sort of explanation we're dealing with when we talk about favoring relations or in the light of or counting in favor of or any of those norm normative rational relations. So that's the best I can do. Um, and I don't know that anybody can do anybody else who does better, let me say quickly. Uh, I would uh, be, yeah. <laughs> um, I think you had a question, no? So let's. <coughs> See if you could pass this microphone on, on to mm. like that. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was so for the people that are not super satisfied with the inexplicability of the because relation, um, I'm thinking here of the point 25. 
so it's a TS target, target condition. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, three here might look like a, a promising alternative. And I just wanted to hear if you had, because you kind of cut the, the talk short there. Yeah. If you had like some kind of target views in mind here, if that's what Satya opts for, or and or like some maybe some f first glance reasons for why you don't think this strategy works. Um, this is I'm just telling you here what Satya does in his paper that we we, we agreed it, but uh, it's not me. It's, it's, it's me trying to be fair. That's what's going on at this point. Um, the um, you want, but you're asking me to say more about three, aren't you? Well, uh, well, okay. So, I mean, yes, this is what Satya does in his paper, but just uh, why, why opt for? Uh, you think two is more plausible? That's the route you take. Uh, but what are some reasons for uh, not taking three then? Um. Why shouldn't I take three? Um, well, I mean, the short answer is I couldn't see how, how to make it work. I mean, you know, that's the short answer, but you want a better answer than that. Yeah, well, I'm sure you do. You, I mean, um, firstly, um, I don't know any suitable account of the relevant because that will do the trick. So I'm trying to get by without one. Um, basically giving up on the because, which looks as, you know, it's sort of half causal rather than explanatory. It's sort of semi-explanatory. And I'm trying to uh, sort of um, think that I'm not involved in that kind of explanation. Um, so that's the sort of... Um, the the rational side of it. Um, uh, the um, well, hang on a minute. I'm, what about we're talking about three, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. I'm t I'm in two. You're in, th or you're one. You're asking about three. A metaphysical account of what it is. I mean, I'm sort of feel that I'm a bit short of one of those. Um, so not knowing how to make any progress on that front um, and feeling that I'm um, not only comfortable with two, but really keen on two. Um, that's why I'm not giving three any time. Uh, but I don't, I mean, if you ask what a meso metaphysical account of belief would be, it's going to have to be, you're going to say something about psychological states, you're going to have to talk about directions of fit. It's going to be very complicated. Um, uh, whereas, and then you've got a causal relation between the belief and the action, which I'm not. You know, that's why I go for two because I don't. Want, I mean, this is not a very good answer to your question. No, it's fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank you. No, no, you're right. Um, I dodge this by ending up. I will do this. I will opt for two without um, really criticizing the alternatives. Um, that's partly, of course, because I'm comfortable with two. So I don't feel the need to, you know, to lambast the opposition. <laughs> um, that's, there we are. That's best I can do. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> can I get the microphone? Because Daniel. Um, hi. Thanks. Hi. Um, so I've been thinking a little bit about the question you raised on 24. Um, is there a difference between? I think you mean a reason to uh, not v and a reason against ving. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm going to propose a, a kind of difference and in case I forget to tack it on, I guess mm. the question is, well, what do you think about this? Um, so at least when it comes to moral reasons, it seems that the reason against will, I don't know, I want to say have a kind of priority or uh, so, so, so co contrast, uh, you know, the mm. reason I have against shoving Alex and say the reason to 
not shot Alex. Alex. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and it, it might just be because there, there's a prohibition, but it seems like even if we focus on the reason, <laughs> qua reason, mm. assuming we can even d divvy it up, assuming yeah. once there already is an art there. But yeah, I'm, it's, okay, so I mean, there's look, kind of... Okay, so, f sorry, yeah. yeah. Wherever you come, there. Um, I mean, I got favoring and disfavoring, and being and not being. Yeah. You know, those are my players here. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, the counting in favor of not doing it seems, might to me, to be a different thing from counting against doing it. You get the same result. Well, that's what I was thinking of saying. Um, <laughs> counting in favor of, what have I said here? Where am I? 28. Is there a gap between favoring not being and disfavoring being? Um, is there such an action as not being? Yeah. Um, there, the fact that there are some not beings that are not actions, like I'm not flying to Moscow at the moment, that's not an action of mine, according to me, um, doesn't show that there aren't some actions that are not beings. Uh, like I decide not to promote you <laughs> this year. That looks like a perfectly ordinary decision. Against. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep, but it seems that the so, say my reason against shoving Alex is that it's wrong. But I, I'll still, you could still make sense of my abstaining to, or my my not, my not shoving him or abstaining from shoving him. Oh, I might do it in light of, the you know the the reasons that count against it. Um, but maybe this is just the point about the kind oh, of see, moral psychological right. force of prohibitions. Okay. No, all that. Look, okay. I got hold of that bit. Um, there are the wrong making features, and then there's the wrongness that they make. Yeah? Um, now, you say, they might say the reasons against doing it are the wrong making features that it would upset everybody and so on. Yeah. Um, and that isn't at all the same as saying that the reason against doing it is the wrongness that they make. But I've had enough reasons not to do it already. Yeah. Um, so, so, does that sound all right, that bit? That bit, yeah. Um, now, I, uh, um, if I act in the light of the wrongness that the features make, I've certainly got to have some conception of those features. I, I, I mean, I suppose I might say, it just feels wrong, I'm not sure quite why. Yeah, all right, I could say that. It does happen sometimes, doesn't it, that you... you think, I, it, this is fishy. I'm not sure why, but it's fishy. I won't do it. I, don't, I won't go down that way. Sure. And that makes perfectly good sense to us all, I, think, I, I hope. Um, the, but what about a case where um, I've got the wrong-making features and the wrongness made, and my reason is the features, not the wrongness. That's a, that seems to me possible. Um, just as you know, we've got the, the amusing making features and the amusingness that is made. And you, why are you telling that joke? You say it's a, it's a, it's a great laugh. Um, you, you might say it's got these nice features. But um, so ordinarily, we don't need to choose, of course, we just don't. But from the philosophical point of view, we won't want to know what's going on. All right, that's a bit, I can't do much better than that. It was a nice question. Thanks. OK, I think we are reaching, yeah, we are reaching the very end of this. So, But there will be a mingle afterwards. So anyone who wants to continue the discussion, you are very welcome. So. Jonathan, thank yeah. you very much for yeah. this. Thank you for an excellent question. <laughs>